Thanks, everybody. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> got a. We got a, five of the of the hateful eight here, guys. This is uh, pretty incredible. I'm gonna brag for a second. I've had the chance to see this movie, and as I told you guys, I can't wait to see it a second time. It's unbelievable. There's so many twists. It's gonna actually be hard to have this conversation without giving away any of the amazing spoilers that happened in the movie. But one spoiler that I will give away, I want to open this up to Walton. Walton, you've done one movie with Tarantino before, kind of a smaller part, but I think this is what they say when they define the term breakthrough role. You've been on, in a number of television shows and movies, but this is a starring, massive role in a Quentin Tarantino movie that seems like it was written for you. I'm sorry, would you say that one more time? Because it, it just sounds so good. No, yeah, you know, you, uh, you know I've been around a long time. Uh, as have everybody up on this stage, but uh, but for me, you know, my my career path uh, uh, really kind of started in earnest in, in television with the Shield, and and you just hope, you know, uh, as an actor that you can hang around long enough and and do work worthy of uh, getting the attention of someone like uh, like like Quentin, and and you get to work with uh, a, a cast like this. You know, there there was a moment on uh, on Django where I, I turned around and it was. Quentin Tarantino up on a ladder with Christoph Waltz and, uh, and, and Jamie Foxx and Leonardo DiCaprio. And, and I was supposed to say something. It was my close-up. And, and I turned around and I said, oh, my God, I'm in a Quentin Tarantino movie. <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of the enthusiasm and excitement, you know, that he, he generates. He, he creates this, uh, uh, this, this place where, where magic can happen. And then for that to happen in, in this cast, to be invited back, and to be around people that you consider icons uh, from, from a distance. But now they're icons, but they're, they're my friends, you know, and, and it was an extraordinary opportunity. I'm, I'm just very, very grateful to, to Quentin and, and to these guys for it. This guy did a great job. Oh, it, I did an amazing, I mean, all of you guys did an incredible job. But, yeah, uh, Walton is, is amazing in the movie. All of you guys are great. Tim, you know, this is your third time out with, with Quentin, fourth time out, excuse me, with Quentin. Um, do you still have that feeling that Walton has when you get on a Quentin set and you see the dialogue that you get to do, the costume, and you see what you're about to do, that, oh, my God, I'm in a Quentin Tarantino movie? Does it feel different for you as a job? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have that sense of enthusiasm, that sense of wonder, because you ne what, I mean, what he brings into the room is a completely different game as well. So it's not just with the actors, you know, uh, who are all on the top of their game, but then he's going to bring in something very, very special. So yeah, and he's a different guy from the um, from the guy that I started working with in Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction and so on. He's a different different animal. He's developed. He's you know he's grown as a filmmaker in, in stature, and also his scripts have changed and developed, and they're more literary now. So it's a completely it's a different guy, but the same energy driving it. It's, it's quite wonderful. He's changed. You've changed as an actor, but you're all still covered in blood. Like Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> yeah, but me and Tim and Tim and I actually got stuck together one day on the set of Reservoir Dogs. Uh, we both had so much blood on us, and uh, we were hugging <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, because we love each other. And but it was one of those hugs that lasted a little too long, and uh, because the blood was almost already sticky, dry, they actually had to have a garden hose to to separate us. <laughs> it was really funny. But luckily, this time we're on opposite sides of the room, so when bad things happen. <laughs> uh, Kurt, I think I watched a, a feature out where Samuel L. Jackson said that you have a cowboy inside of you all the time, that you are a cowboy at heart. Is that true? Yeah, I've lived that life, you know. <laughs> I mean, I live, in, I live four hours uh, from where we shot, so... I'm I'm real comfortable in that environment, and and um, it, it's just something that's part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And now uh, this is your second time out in a Tarantino movie, right? After after Death Proof, and um, how did how did Quentin approach you with this role? Um, well, just quickly, uh, got a phone call one day from Quentin, and he said, "I'm going to do a reading of a, a thing I wrote. Would you do that?" And I said, "Yeah, that'd be fun because you do that sometimes. We all get a call from a friend who's a director or actor friend. These guys will do it in the future. Well, I'll do it. Can you come and help out? Be, you know, maybe read three or four roles, give the director a look at it. So it was like that. And then he wanted to rehearse it, and I, that's kind of strange. Usually, you don't do that. And then um, I, we rehearsed it on a Thursday and got to meet all the guys and. And then uh, wanted to rehearse the next day, and I thought, wow, he's really getting this in shape for somebody, you know. Then I found out that day we were going to actually do it 
in front of 1,600 people at a theater for a charity event. And I thought, oh, this is that script that he, that was leaked that he really got angry about. And he wants to hear it once before he puts it to sleep. Okay, that's cool. And then we did it the next day. And then he, the next thing I knew, a couple months later, he was going to make the movie. And I said to my agent, I said, did he say anything about me doing it or not doing it or what? He said, oh, no, no, he wants you to do it. I said, oh, great. So you weren't sure if, uh, if you were going to be in the, in the movie? I didn't, I didn't. No, he just did, did a, you know, I did, it wasn't like, yeah, it was just that way. It was, I, I did kind of come went step by step by step. It, things were assumed that I didn't know. That, that was like what it was. Uh, Damon, you play uh, Senor Bob, right? Uh, it's not a spoiler, but your accent in the movie is so funny. It's so over the top. Can you give the audience just a taste of it for a second? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I really don't know what you're talking about. I was trying to imitate uh, My Michael's voice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing, well, uh, uh, God damn it. You were doing like a Mexican Michael? <laughs> yeah. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, God damn it. Especially he has, when I he has line readings in this that 30 years from now, you're going to like, remember badges? We don't need those thinking badges. He's got about five of them there. I mean, that's what it sort of felt like to me that he was writing for you uh, with that, that line from Treasure of the Sierra Madre over and over again, just different variations of it. How did you guys come up or stick to uh, this version of, uh, of the accent? Was it something that you no, pitched it to was, him? Um, well, um, we were, when we were uh, rehearsing and uh, doing all this uh, work, uh, uh, reading, and uh, before even uh, we began to block anything, we, we were just, you know, reading. It was like a, a theater process. And uh, I grew up in the theater, so it was, uh, I, was, I was comfortable with it. And, uh, and it was beautiful to see these guys in action. To me, that was, that was it. I, I had uh, uh, the, first, uh, the, uh, the best seat on the house to watch these uh, uh, guys uh, do what they do. And then, uh, you know, you bring things to the table and uh, you hope that uh, your director won't stop you until, you know, it's too much or... And uh, so I kept on, you know, I, I grew my beard. Uh, that was an eight month uh, uh, long beard. And, eight uh, months? Eight months, wow. ever. I mean, I, I've never, you know, had it that long in my life. And, and it was good because back in the mountains, um, if you're a tropical fish, that helps. You know, because it was it was really warm. really cold, and that that you know it, it helped a lot, and uh, so I I just kept on going and going and going, and uh, and then I say one day he's gonna call me up and he say you know Damien I I think you shouldn't do that you know, and then I will stop, and then one day he called me up and say I like what you're doing, <laughs> so I thought okay this is this is perfect we're in the uh, right direction. Well, that's something that I've always been interested with Tarantino. And Tim, you had said this when I was talking about that everything is on the page. It's all really his dialogue. But it seems like there's still an incredible amount of freedom for the actors to interpret that dialogue and go as over the top. And I don't mean that in a bad way at all. I mean that in the greatest way possible, as over the top and as fun as they want to be with that dialogue. How does he, how does he direct that? How does he let that he, happen? He will definitely reel you in. I mean, if you're... <laughs> It's not like it's out of control and you can do whatever you want. Uh, I mean, he's the captain of the ship, and if he doesn't like what you're doing, he's going to come over and tell you not to do that. But he's also incredibly uh, collaborative in the way that he'll let you try something. He's like, you know, can I do this or do that? And he'll say, yeah, sure, go ahead and show me that. And he'll say, yeah, okay, that, that, that's good, or, or, or not. But when you're on a set with him, the last thing you want to do is, is, <laughs> is, is disappoint him. You want to do what he wants you to do. You know, he, if he wrote the role for you especially, you want to do what uh, he expects of you. He's very much in command, you know. He, he's more than any other director I've ever worked with. I feel like he wrote the role for all of you. For everybody in the movie, he wrote the role for them. Is that a challenge? Does that feel like pressure to, to you as an actor? I think actually some of them he didn't. Like Jennifer's character... Um, he, he didn't, he, I think, intentionally didn't keep anyone in mind. He wanted to let that develop and, uh, to, uh, in, during the writing process and also during the, the filming process when he had her on board. So, um, but it, it, when he does write for you, he writes to your sense of humor, to your um, uh, hates, loves and hates and so on. So, it, you know, my stuff, he, uh, he knows I, I 
have a healthy loathing of the upper classes in England. So he... <laughs> he does, thought, yeah. really. No, he really does. Yeah, so it's true. So um, he wrote that kind of, or, you know, superficially, that kind of character so that you would feel that disgust coming through and that there'd be that dark underbelly under it. So, it's, it, you know, everything is on the page. You don't need to improvise. He's kind of done it for you. He's worked it all out. You know. Walton, how would you say he wrote for, for you? Uh, your loves wow, and your you know, I, I mean, how did he... I don't know how he specifically wrote for me. I, I guess he, he would be best to kind of answer that question, but uh, his writing is so lyrically poetic, and, and I've heard Tim say this, I've heard Michael say this. Uh, he, he, he is able to, to, to cast people or, or look like deep in a, a crowd of people and a hundred unbelievable actors. He's able to pick one that can say his dialogue the way that he hears it in his imagination. And he's not just gotten it right one time, he's gotten it right over the course of his career with, with every single person that he has put in one of his movies. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, for me, in, a, in addition to just, just the words, it's Chris Maddox is a rather loquacious guy. Um, it's also just the arc that, you know, he has in the story without giving anything away. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, and, and, I, and I did a, uh, a show um, we just ended called Justified, and it was based on an Elmore Leonard short story. And, uh, Quentin's and Quentin, a huge El Elmore Leonard. Yeah. I mean, Jackie Brown, yeah. Yeah, yeah Quentin was really uh, impacted by Elmore, and they were, they were really good friends. And, uh, and, and the, the, the character that I played was uh, a talker, you know? And so I, I think it just kind of made sense, and so he had seen that and, and uh, had been, when I say influenced by it, he just he liked the show, you know? So... I don't want to know how he did it. I'm just grateful he did it. <laughs> I'm curious. Do you think, Walden, do you think you surpassed the amount of days uh, Tim spent covered in blood on Reservoir Dogs with the amount of blood you were covered in, in, uh, in, for shooting days on this movie? Oh, oh I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, you, you, <laughs> Tim I says yes. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, it was, because uh, you don't want to give too much away, but, but there were, you know, there were, there were moments in, in the story, because... Every, look, you're, you're going to be on a floor. If you're in a Quentin Tarantino movie, eventually you will be face down on that's a floor. What that's what he does. And so that's really not giving anything away. But the, uh, the thing that was, that was really difficult was, in this particular instance, in, in, in my case, uh, and the same for, for Sam and a few of us, it was cold, man. It was, it was really, really cold. And, and you couldn't escape you know, that, that, that cold. They were also, in addition to pumping in uh, the cold air, they were pumping in humidity as well. So it was colder on the stage in Los Angeles than it was in, in Telluride. And there was just no way to escape it. And when it's your turn to be on the floor in a Quentin Tarantino movie, he's pumping it up from below. So you're like, oh, man, I thought I was going to get away from it. But, but you're not, you know. And, uh, but it's, yeah, it's just, just an extraordinary experience. Now, uh so much of the film takes place on this, in, in, this, in this cabin, in Minnie's haberdashery, which I'm imagining was a, a, a set, a studio. It's, it's unbelievable, the set design inside of this. But at the same time, all of you have said, I've seen that you're pretty much on camera the whole time in the movie because it's shot in this beautiful 70 millimeter. It's such a wide frame that if Tim is the sort of in the, in, in the scene, you guys are in the background finding something to do. What was that like, Damien, uh, knowing that you were going to be in the background of a shot that maybe you didn't have that much to do with? Again, you know, it was like a theater. It is like a theater play. Uh, it makes you aware. It, it wakes you up. And uh, it lets you enjoy everything also. You know, you, you want to be a part of it fully. And that's, you know, what happened to us. I mean, is this essentially a director uh, like Quentin Tarantino creates a set of challenges for everybody? It's not just the challenge of doing loquacious, long-winded, loquacious dialogue that's beautiful and taking the time to memorize it, but also being like, you guys are good at that. Hey, let's put you in this thing where you're going to have stuff to do in the background in every shot as well. And it's also going to be in 70 millimeters, so you have to think about your whole body. So he's constantly sort of keeping you on your toes as a performer. Kurt, does it feel like that when you're doing the movie, that Quentin's keeping you on your toes as a performer? No, it's the same as any other movie in that regard. Yeah. I mean, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the 70, when you're working, I mean, if, if we're doing this scene and all of us are up here and we're all in the shot, we're all in the shot, whether the, it's on a little television set on your, on your watch or whether it's 70 millimeter. I understand that, you know, you, you can read the old time stuff about actors who, when it's close up, they'll bring it down. 
And I, I didn't come from that. I, I came from that world, but I didn't come from that acting world. I don't know how to do that. So it's just like, you know, for me, you just get in there and what's it, what's it feeling like? What, what, what are they doing? What's, what's, how, is, is Tim coming at you or is he backing off? Is Mike sneaking up from behind? Is, is Damien making you laugh? Is, is Walt, are you watching Walton wax poetic and you're getting tired of that or you're loving it or what's going on? I don't know how to, I don't know how to bring that down until the director says, bring it way down. <laughs> you know, or bring it up. You know, for Quentin, a lot of times for me, he would say, like on Death Proof, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. For me, I felt I was being gigantic. So 70 millimeter, I, I suppose you could make a case for bringing it down. Are you guys doing any of that? Or did you? Did no, you, I, I you know? don't. Go ahead, doing the same thing I always did. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I knew it was a bigger frame, but uh, I was supposedly uh, writing my life story, so... At least I had something to do when I was sitting there at the table. Um, and I also felt like it was great because I got to see what everybody else was doing when normally you wouldn't be in that frame and you'd miss a lot of the other actors. You couldn't enjoy watching them build their characters because you wouldn't even be there. So it's odd that he would choose 70 millimeter in one room yeah. or in a confined space, but... Uh, it was, uh, I love the big machines, you know. It, it, it's, I'm from that school. Uh, I'm, I'm for film, and I, I love to, to do film. I'm, I'm sad that it's sort of creeping away, but I think that was the main reason, one of the main reasons he did it was to remind everybody of the experience of watching a big movie, you know, shot big with big machines. And that big movie doesn't have to be landscapes. That big movie is reminding us that the close-up is really beautiful as well in the cinema, yeah. which I think is a huge part of the film and why it's sort of doing the statement of 70 millimeter in such a confined space. You know, I, uh, just to, to jump in here uh, on this part of the conversation, well, I think, because, yeah, if we're, if we're off camera, if you're doing well, insert movie here with these guys you're, and you're ordering a drink at a bar, you're going to order a drink at a bar. Just because you're off camera doesn't mean you're not playing pretend. That's what you do for your fellow actors. But I, I think the thing that was that was surprising and really watching the movie was how, how intentional and how specific from a very, very, very specific filmmaker, how deep the story goes in every single frame. It is not just the person in focus where the, where the story is happening. It's the person out of focus behind them or the person out of focus behind the person out of focus all the way to the window. And you look at the snow and you see the anger of the snow as the day progresses. And so when you watch the movie a second time, you're watching a completely different experience. And, and the only other thing I'll say, you know, for, for, for these guys, and just being a fan of, of, of Quentin's, like, like everybody here, he writes super characters, man. Like, these guys have played, these guys are superhero, like Quentin Tarantino's super character heroes. But more often than not, you get to, uh, on, on, the, on the movies that he's made so far, rarely do you get an opportunity to have everybody in the room at once. Right, so you have all these unbelievable characters saying all of this unbelievable dialogue. But if you're and you can bet when you show up on set that day, something magical is going to happen. But then you have a day off because Sam Jackson's up or whatever, and you can bet when you're off, something magical is going to happen that day. And and I think what was so special about this for all of us is that we were there, like we would all be talking, and then it would get dark. Michael would step out, and it would be his turn or Kurt would step out and it would be his turn. And we all got to see the work, man. We all got to witness Quentin's characters throughout this entire experience. And, and that's very rare. So even if you were not sort of in a shot that day, you were most likely on set, sort of in a bullpen waiting to get called in just in case you were gonna be in a shot. You didn't wanna miss anything. I mean, really, wow. you know, you, you might think that you could get jaded over the years and then not. I mean, you got a great crew out there like this. I wanna watch these guys. I wanna, you know, I, I'm looking at it and saying, yeah, I get a chance uh, to have two times, anyway, in this movie, to bring Snake Plissken over to talk to Mr. Blonde in a certain way. That's going to be fun. I was like, I want to do that. I don't want to miss that. So I want to watch all of what Mike has to do, you know what I mean? You want to bring what you, you want to bring your baggage into their baggage, and they're, they're going to bring their baggage into your baggage, and that's going to be a fun day. Yeah. So you don't want to miss that. And if you get to watch Samuel L. Jackson with Bruce Dern at one point for an extended period of time. It's awesome. amazing. Yeah. Um, you also get to watch you and Jennifer Jason Lee have these amazing scenes together. And I was wondering as an actor, I, I don't think this is giving too much away because you are her captor in the trailer. 
you throw her so many shots in the face in the first 20 minutes of the movie. Did you, how many apologies did you also throw her when doing, I would have been like, I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry. I didn't have to apologize. <laughs> I, like, oh, I, don't know I never hit her. I wanted to, I was, uh, you know, I really did, was, it was very important for me to um, earn Jennifer's trust as, 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 an, as an actor he was working with. That chain was a real thing. It was, it was, at first, I read that and I went, okay, they're chained up. And then, uh, the first couple of days of rehearsal, we looked at each other and said, we got, we got to figure this chain thing out because we can't, we can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I can't get my gun near you. I got I to gotta make coffee and stuff. And so that chain became very uh, important for the two of us to deal with. But it's real simple. The character that I'm playing is a bounty hunter who's bringing in a wildcat. She's a feral wildcat who will do anything to survive. She wants to claw my eyes out and kill me. I set the ground rule down. So, you, you know, you step outside that ground rule, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, to tap you. And her character is going to push that button, going to push that button. Gonna, you know, they're like an abusive couple. Yeah. That she, you know, but even in an abusive couple, there's moments of tenderness or care. And well, she was fantastic. Let me just say she's not here. All the boys are very proud of our girl. She's, uh, she's starting to rack up some things now, some awards. And just, she's deserving of everything she gets. She uh, is fantastic in the movie, created a fantastic character, and the conditions under which she worked. You talk about the blood and all that. Um, never once complained. She's, we're all, she's deserving of everything yeah. she gets. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't complain because we were watching what she was going through. So yeah. we're like, okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> hands, hands down, that, is, that's, that was yeah. the toughest. Yeah. Yeah. She's, in, she's incredible in the movie. It's interesting to hear the chain, though, because that definitely plays a part in, in the role. The way that they're chained together is sort of all about how they react with each other as captor and captee. And then also there's a certain amount of, of kind of friends. There's a certain amount of begrudging respect for each other that they have to have because of the chain. You can see how that, that sort of reality would play into the actual performances as well. Well, we laughed about it as we talked. We said, it's Fred and Ginger. I mean, they, you know, we gotta, we got to learn to dance together here. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it is funny because there is a, you know, a Stockholm syndrome that sets up for not just the characters. It's going to come through who the actors are. And uh, about a month in, I was at home, and I, I noticed that um, we didn't talk a great deal, Jennifer and I. We didn't, we didn't say much during the day. Hadn't for the month of rehearsal. Now we're in shooting for about a month. And I, I talked to the guys all the time, you know, and uh, didn't know what to make of that. I didn't, you know, she just didn't talk very much, and neither did I. And one day Goldie said to me, she said, so how's the uh, Stockholm Syndrome of it all coming along? And I said, funny you should say that, because I, I don't know. And I actually mentioned that to Jennifer, and we started talking about it. Now, we'd been working on it, and it had been, you know, creeping in there, but then we made, a, we made an effort to talk to each other about what it was we did think we could bring into the two characters. Because there's John Ruth, there's Daisy Domergue, and then there's a third character for those two, which they create together, and that's, you know, that's Ruth and Domergue, and it's almost, it's a little bit like the Honeymooners on steroids, you know? And uh, so, anyway, that was, that was kind of what came out of that chain. And now I heard no one is allowed to bring their phone on a Tarantino set, not just out of fear of something ringing while you're shooting, but you're basically not, when cut is called, you're not really allowed to check your text messages or your emails, right? That was fine with me, because I think that whole world has become a bit obnoxious. <laughs> I mean, I was happy not to get a call. There wasn't any calls I needed to make either, so I didn't bring my phone, but... They had a Checkpoint Charlie, and everybody had to drop off their devices with Checkpoint Charlie on the way to the set. So um, the only time that I've ever heard a phone ring was I was doing a TV show with Guy Ritchie, and he told everybody, no phones on this set. And he was riding the dolly, and his phone started ringing. <laughs> it was really... <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, I was pretty, I was okay with it, but that's, that's the true story, yeah. But I'd imagine if you're walking in at the mo in the morning, you're all on set, you're in the bullpen, whether you're in shots or not, and you don't have a phone on you to be checking email while other people are working, everybody is committed, engaged, and thinking about your performance, somebody else's performance, and where the story is going that it's day. It's not just that, that's the crew, yeah. right? I mean, you're not, looking, you're not looking at each other doing a scene, and in the background there's someone on the crew checking up. The phone, you know, it's everyone's there. They're focused to get on, on, you know, on point, right? So yeah, well, I mean, it just also gives a, an opportunity for not only not only actors, not only crew, but just this group of people to to move in tandem with each other because you actually listen. You know, there there's nothing taking you away from that. There is nothing to run to 
once you stop performing your job for a minute, you actually get to know people intimately and you have an opportunity to become vulnerable. And that's, uh, you know, that's the conditions that, that he creates and that's what Quentin wants and, uh, and, and we're a, a product of that environment. And I think the cast that have uh, been on a, on a Tarantino movie have that experience going forward. It's, and, and Tim and I talked about this, uh, and this thing that we were just doing. If you see somebody that you've worked with, if you've had the, uh, an invitation to work with Quentin Tarantino more than once, or even just once, and you see someone in a, in a random restaurant across the street coming out of the bathroom, you just look at that person and you just go, oh, come here, come on, come on over here, let's go. And then you meet in the middle and you just hug because it's, it's such a special experience. And you, you can't even really talk about it to a civilian. You just say, all right, love you. I enjoy your pasta. I'll see you later. You know, <laughs> like that's what it is, man. That's, that's just kind of the culture of the, the creative space that, that he creates. I think we have some time for uh, audience questions. Anyone have any questions out here in the audience? We're going to start with a question from an online viewer. So Dan would like to know for everyone, what advice would you give to another actor working with Quentin Tarantino for the first time? That will hear you. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. advice were you given? Uh, uh, yeah, I was a virgin. I was a Tarantino <laughs> virgin until this time. No, you were a virgin, Damien. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I still are. It's out there. I think it's the same rule to work with any director. You know, you have to be there. Um, by being there, I mean no cell phones on set. That doesn't need to be a rule. You know, a Quentin, Quentin, made it, um, Quentin made it a rule, but it shouldn't be a rule. It should be part of your own discipline. Uh, also, as uh, this guy said, you know, you don't want to disappoint whoever is trusting you. You have to give your best because that might be your for, uh, for the first of many or the last. Yeah. Is it the kind of thing where it should be the rule on every set, but it's something about Quentin set where you definitely know that is the rule and it's, it's got to be that way? It, it's 1870, 1875. Why do you want that in your thought process? It's, yeah. It doesn't belong there. It just flat doesn't belong there. But I have to say that, you know, I think we all agree that it doesn't belong on any set. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hi, so I have two things. Um, this one's for you, Kurt. Um, my mom knows you from Aspen, Rowan Kilbreth. Oops. Back in the day. Hello. Whoa. So, uh, Hello. Uh oh. Uh -oh. We want Kurt to answer this question. Okay. I know. She told me to say hi to you. But, um, so. <laughs> hi, hi. That didn't go as planned. What was your favorite part about filming the movie? Each of you. For me, it was it was one of the things that was really fun was being four hours from home, uh, being because I, I three times I went drove home for I had long weekends and could drive home and it was really nice being in that environment. I like I like it's my favorite environment. I like it a lot. So say hi to your mom. <laughs> Give her my best. She'll know what I mean. <laughs> it's an old joke. It's an old joke. <laughs> Top that. <laughs> Moving right along. Yeah. Yeah, um, this is a question for kind of all the actors here. Um, so The Hateful Eight is, as you said, sort of um, almost can be like a stage play. And I wanted to know, I mean, I think specifically Damon, because you talked about being a stage actor, and I think Tim as well. Um, I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but if you had to choose between either only doing film for the rest of your life or only doing stage acting for the rest of your life. If oh, it's, uh, oh, sorry, bye. No, go for if it's doing theater with this group of actors for the rest of my life, come in. I'm, I, I, I have awful stage fright. I, I, it terrifies me. So I'm happy, I'm absolutely happy just to do movies. I'd rather stick with movies myself, yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm not interested in playing Hamlet, that's for sure. <laughs> I'd see that. <laughs> That'd be a good one, though. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I love, uh, I, lo I mean, I, you know, I have not spent a lot of time on stage. I, I would really like to have that experience in a, in a much bigger way. But uh, in this hypothetical, uh, if, if it's one or the other, there is something so, so pure about, about film and, 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 and my experience in television, to be quite honest with you. You know, it's a... Uh, I got to spend 84 hours uh, in one experience and 78 hours in another, and and you get 
you know, that, that place in between action and cut, being on location with, with people and kind of forming these bonds, man, and, and, and just kind of how the day flows and moving the day. I, 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 love, I love being in front of that camera. I, I really, I really do. It's a good question, and I think this is an interesting group to ask that of because we've just come back from Paris and London, some of us, and we spent a lot of time talking about how much fun it would be to do the Hateful Eight with the original cast on the stage yeah. somewhere. And if we get that opportunity, maybe we could actually answer that question. You know, that honestly. would be incredible. Wouldn't it? I would love to see how the blood and guts work on the For stage. Instance, <laughs> what sort of pragmatic effects or right. practical effects are used. Uh, next question. Uh, we talked about hardship, about weather earlier, but growing a beard and stuff. So, uh, Kurt, did you get flashbacks to the filming of The Thing, and did you have tips for other people as well how to deal with that? <laughs> you know, The Thing was a lot rougher in terms of what the weather was. It was really cold. Alaska was really cold. And um, in terms of comfort, this was much more comfortable, and it was, but it was just the same thing. You're in the environment, provides the environment for you as the actor to, to be in, and you don't, have to, you don't really have to think about anything. You just sort of be in it. And um, as far as the facial hair concerned, it keeps you warmer, I'll give you that. Uh, it's interesting to bring up John Carpenter, though, because I feel like Tarantino is a huge Carpenter fan, and I definitely saw touches of Carpenter on the, the Hateful Eight in terms of his framing, how he sets up these characters, and how he works, I think, with, with, with you as an actor. Did you ever talk to Tarantino about your work with Carpenter, or did he ever reference it at all with you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he 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 showed us the movie, the thing, which I had to endure with the gang. He also he also yeah. He, of course, he does it Quentin style, which is he also includes um, ads from old Disney movies that I was in. You know, so it's like it's a, you got to you, you're gonna be the the fun butt of the joke. Got to go with it. It's all good. But he did. He can I kind of connect the dots here with uh, people being um, locked inside from a storm, a, a winter storm, paranoia. All those things, and uh, yes, he does talk about it. He doesn't talk specifically about it with me. He like, doesn't connect the characters up or anything like that. But he, he definitely had a connection to the thing. And, and by the way, Ennio Morricone does yeah. the music in both, so yeah. you know that's it's 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 obvious. Yeah. The score in this movie is wild. It's it's, it's unbelievable. Like it's it's rare. It's rare that you get an Ennio Morricone score, but it's rare that you get one like this. This, I think, is one in, like top five, one of his best ever. Yeah, yeah and yeah. it's the first western in forty years, right? First, first in 40, yeah, that any has done. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, next, it's beautiful. It's a fantastic score. You're right. Yeah. Next question. Hey, guys. I um, just wanted to say I've been raised on all of you guys since I was you know, a wee little kid. I've, I've caught girlfriends honey bunny because of you. I, uh, when Stuck in the Middle with you comes on, I do, I do backslides, uh, Mr. Madison. Uh, but I, I wanted to know how you felt, uh, Kurt Russell, about uh, Big Town. Oh, that. Big Town, what about... Trouble, China. China. Big trouble in Little China? Yeah, Big Trouble in Little China and the remake with The Rock. How do you feel about it? Oh, hey, you know, listen, I'm, I'm nothing sacred, especially anything I ever was involved with, but, uh, you know, hey, man, go after it. I hope you, I hope you got a, a, you know, a reason to make it. I, I've seen a lot of sequels and, or remakes in my life that I just couldn't understand why they did it, but I hope that they do it well. You know, go out there, do it well. I think The Rock is a good choice. I didn't get to work. I did a, a Fast and Furious uh, number seven, and he was in it. I didn't get to work with him, so he seems like a really nice guy. I think that he, he can bring something to the role, you know, that could be fresh and new. And hopefully, they'll do something great, have at it, but make you know, do something good. Prosthetics and maybe one of the monsters, maybe just do a cameo. It's a cool script. I like the ones I did. <laughs> <laughs> um. Before, uh, before we let these guys go, I want to say on Christmas Day, it, the road show premieres for the Hateful Eight are happening. These are the, the ones that are in 70 millimeter. They have the overture, the intermission. This is what I've seen. It is unbelievable. It's a cinematic experience that you're only going to have once or three or four times if you go to that version as many times as I will. But then I think on New Year's Day, the, uh, the DCP, the shorter version, comes out in multiplexes across the country. That's going to be great, too, but I highly recommend Christmas Day. You go see the 70 millimeter Roadshow of The Hateful Eight. There's nothing else like it. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you.